Hello, and welcome to the next installment of Law & Order, the deep dive video series in which we look through and unpack game lore and stories from games. This time around we'll be looking at the story from The Last of Us. Now this isn't specifically exclusive for part 2, so we will also briefly discuss what happened in part 1 as well. Due to this game's narrative taking place over the course of many years and going back and forth a lot, we'll incorporate the entire plot into a timeline explanation first so as to piece everything together more easily. Ready? And let's go! The date is September 26th, 2013. Outbreak Day. Austin, Texas. The city goes into quarantine due to a mysterious illness going round. The Last of Us's prologue takes place and Joel's daughter Sarah is killed. At the end of 2013, the CDC, FEDRA and the US military are the only remaining factions of the US government. A militia group called the Fireflies are started up by a lady called Marlene, and the Fireflies are at war with the military and FEDRA. Infection quickly spreads throughout the country, breaking through quarantine zones. In early 2019, Ellie was born. We don't know who her father was, but her mother was a nurse who was friends with the leader of the Fireflies, Marlene. Marlene becomes Ellie's guardian at the request of Ellie's mother, Anna, who is dead. At some point between 2013 and 2033, Joel's brother Tommy joins the Fireflies and Joel becomes a smuggler in Boston. They go their separate ways due to Tommy's disapproval of Joel's methods of survival. In 2033, Ellie and her friend Riley are bitten during the first timeline of events in Left Behind, revealing that Ellie is immune. The main events of The Last of Us 1 start. Marlene tasks Joel and his partner Tess to smuggle Ellie out of the Boston quarantine zone and hand her over to the Fireflies at the Capitol building deep in the city of Boston. The reason being that Ellie's immunity has the potential to be used for a cure. However, the Fireflies that were waiting there have been killed. Tess dies, sacrificing herself so that Joel and Ellie can continue on their journey. At some point on their journey, Joel is injured and the second timeline of events of Left Behind takes place. In late April 2034, after nearly a year of travelling, Ellie and Joel reach Salt Lake City. Ellie is prepped for surgery. Marlene is speaking to Dr. Jerry Anderson, who runs tests on Ellie and determines that she won't survive the operation. His daughter Abby comes in and tells him that if it were her, she'd want him to do the operation. Marlene is disappointed, but agrees for Dr. Anderson to carry out the surgery. She goes to inform Joel of the news, but Joel cannot simply accept that Ellie will die in the process, so he kills the Fireflies, the surgeon, and Marlene in his escape. Joel drives off with Ellie, eventually reaching Jackson. Joel tells Ellie that they don't need her anymore, as there are lots of others immune like her, and that the Fireflies have given up on finding a cure. Abby later finds her father dead and is distraught. Ellie is suspicious of Joel's explanation of what happened at the hospital, making her question how honest he is being with her. In 2035, now the Fireflies are pretty much gone. Abby and her friends, known as the Salt Lake crew, Owen, also Abby's ex-boyfriend, Manny, Nora, Jordan, Nick, Leah and Mel, Owen's current girlfriend, have joined the WLF, the Washington Liberation Front in Seattle. Wanting to avenge the brutal murder of her father, she is frustrated that she is no longer able to find Joel as all the leads to him have dried up. In 2036, due to her suspicions of Joel, Ellie returns to the Fireflies Hospital in Salt Lake City and works everything out due to a tape recording found inside the operating room. Even if we found her, or by some miracle found someone else that's immune, it'd make no difference. Because the only person who could develop a vaccine is dead. She tells Joel, we're done, and doesn't speak to him anymore. In December 2037, Abby informs Owen that she has found Tommy. I found Joel's brother. He's at a settlement out in Wyoming. How do you know that? The Fireflies who served with him got picked up at the wall. Due to him being an ex-Firefly, one of Tommy's old friends, who is also a Firefly, reveals his whereabouts. In early 2038, Abby and her friends arrive in Jackson, and they stay at the abandoned Baldwin Mansion. In March 2038, this is where everything kicks off. Ellie and Dina kiss at a dance, prompting an old man named Seth to throw a homophobic slur at Ellie and Dina. Joel gets involved and shoves Seth, but Ellie tells Joel she doesn't need his help. Ellie goes to Joel's house and tells him that she will never forgive him for what he did, but she wants to try and forgive him, and they set out to try and repair their relationship. The very next day, Ellie's due out on patrol, but oversleeps, and her and Dina ride out. Meanwhile, Abby and Owen scout the Jackson settlement where Tommy is supposed to be living. Owen drops the bombshell that his current girlfriend Mel is pregnant, and after an argument, Owen and Abby part ways, and Abby decides at that moment to go after Tommy. A storm hits, and Ellie and Dina take shelter underneath an old library. Abby encounters a horde of infected and is chased. She ends up being rescued in some cruel twist of fate by Joel and Tommy. 
Later on, she realizes who they are, and in shock that she is face to face with her father's killer, manages to come to her senses and they escape. She informs them that her friends are being holed up at an old mansion, and they set out for it while being chased by a horde in the storm. Meanwhile, a guy named Jesse, who used to date Dina, arrives at the shelter and informs Ellie and Dina that Joel and Tommy, who are on patrol, didn't show up and they all split up to go find them. Joel, Tommy and Abby arrive at the lodge and a group of friends attack Tommy and Joel, with Abby shooting Joel in the leg and Nora knocking Tommy unconscious. Ellie arrives at the lodge and finds Joel being beaten to death by Abby, who is wielding a golf club. Ellie goes to take Abby down, injuring one of the group in her efforts, but she is ultimately subdued and forced to watch as Abby inflicts the fatal blow upon Joel. In the days after, the Salt Lake crew leave Jackson, Joel's funeral is held, and Tommy leaves for Seattle to pursue Abby and her friends. Ellie and Dina follow suit a day after, leaving for Seattle in order to uncover clues which will lead them to the Washington Liberation Front. A couple of weeks later, the main events of the game run in parallel over the next three days, so we'll do our best to go over them in chronological order. Abby wakes up after a bad dream in the Washington Liberation Front base, located in an old stadium. Abby and another of the Salt Lake crew, Manny, have been called up to the FOB, which is the main base for the WLF, also known as Wolves. It seems that the leader of the WLF, Isaac, is tired of them losing battles against the local cult called the Seraphites, also known as Scars, and is preparing a major assault on the Scars main island. That afternoon, Ellie and Dina arrive in Seattle and look for the Washington Liberation Front, eventually tracking them to an old hotel called the Seravina. However, all the wolves have been taken out. They find one of the Salt Lake crew, Nick, tied to a chair, and Ellie recognizes the torture method as one that Joel used, meaning that this was Tommy's handiwork. During this event, Abby and Manny head out to the FOB, and are now heavily pregnant Mel, a medic, tags along too. They are attacked by scars shortly after leaving their base and are diverted through an old warehouse which is full of infected. They get through it and end up fighting with scars but in the end are rescued by more wolves who pick them up and take them back to the base. Another of the Salt Lake crew, Nora, informs Abby and Manny that Owen's patrol partner Danny is dead and Owen has now gone AWOL. Nora says that Danny crawled back to the camp somehow, dying, and then mentioned in his last breath that Owen killed him. Abby and Manny meet with a WLF leader, Isaac, who tells them that he wants them both to lead the attack on the Scars Island. Abby mentions that she wants to go and find Owen, but Isaac refuses to let her go. Back with Ellie and Dina, they leave the Seravina Hotel, but trip a mine which kills their horse. Dina escapes, but Ellie is captured. Ellie's new captor is revealed to be another of Abby's friends, Jordan, whom Ellie hurt with a knife back in Jackson. After Dina rescues Ellie and Ellie kills Jordan, they find a new lead. Jordan's girlfriend Leah, who is holed up at the old TV station. Ellie and Dina find Leah, but she's dead. She's been killed by scars. Fresh from her orders not to go and get Owen, Abby does it anyway with the help of Manny. However, on her journey through Scar territory, she is knocked out and captured. Upon leaving the TV station, Ellie and Dina get chased by hunters. Chased into the spore infested tunnels below the city, after a tense encounter with some clickers and the hunters, Ellie and Dina escape. However, Ellie's mask breaks, even though she didn't need it. Dina tried to give her mask to Ellie, forcing Ellie to stop her and reveal her secret to Dina, the secret of her immunity. Dina complains that she is super tired, so they both take refuge in the Cassandra Theatre in order to rest. Here, Dina, who has been throwing up on their journey and feeling tired, mentions to Ellie that she is pregnant and the baby is Jessie's. Hours later, Abby comes too. She is dragged into the woods and strung up by the scars. She is just about to be gutted when two more scars drag a young scar girl called Yara in and break her arm. Just as they are about to break the other arm, one of the scars is killed by an arrow and Yara kills the other. Abby kills the third and is cut down. The person who rescued them both is Yara's brother Lev, also a scar. These siblings have been ostracized from their community due to the simple fact that Lev shaved his head. We'll get to why that is a big deal later on. Yara's arm is hurting badly, so Abby and Lev find somewhere where Yara can rest. Abby helps her by making a splint and then leaves for the aquarium in search of Owen again. She finds him aboard a sailboat in the aquarium which he is fixing up, and Owen explains that he shot Danny to defend himself. Abby and Owen sleep together, leading us into day two. Abby has another bad dream about St. Mary's Hospital back in Salt Lake City, where her father died, and the dream involves Yara and Lev. As a result, she's worried about their safety and goes out to get them and brings them back to the aquarium. Around this time, Ellie and Dina identify a WLF hotspot over the radio called Hillcrest, which is a potential lead to where Tommy is. Ellie reaches Hillcrest, but just as she is facing more danger, she comes face to face with Jesse, who has somehow turned up and helps her escape. They retreat back to the theater. Meanwhile, Abby reaches Yara, whose arm is worse now, and Lev, 
and she takes them back to the aquarium. Mel states that Yara needs to have her arm amputated. Abby needs to go to a WLF run hospital and get some supplies. Upon arriving there, Abby is arrested due to Isaac reporting her AWOL. Nora frees her and tells her that the supplies she needs will probably be in a closed off part of the hospital, which just so happens to be ground zero when the outbreak first hits Seattle. Abby finds what she needs, but has to do battle with something called the Rat King, some sort of messed up hybrid infected, which we'll discuss later, and manages to escape, but it does seem that Abby is now being hunted by her own people. Over their radio, Ellie and Dina hear about medical supplies being moved by the WLF, so Ellie tracks Nora down to the hospital. After her very first encounter with the Scars, she arrives at the hospital and finds a way in. Whilst crawling through a vent, she overhears a conversation with two guards who accuse Nora of freeing Abby. Ellie confronts Nora, who taunts Ellie about Joel's death, prompting a chase. Ellie catches her and grabs Nora as a hostage as three guards come through the door. Spotting spores below them and knowing that she is immune, she throws them both down there, which will be fatal for Nora. Ellie catches up to Nora, who is struggling due to the spores, and tortures her for Abby's location. After this event, it's likely around this time that Abby and Lev arrive back at the aquarium and Yara's arm is amputated. Ellie arrives back at the theatre, visibly shaken from what she just did to Nora, and reveals that Abby is holed up at the aquarium, and this leads us into day three. Owen has heard rumours that the Fireflies are active and in Santa Barbara. Yara wants to go, but Lev wants their mother to come with them. However, the problem is that their mother is so devout in her faith that she will never leave the scars. Owen asks Abby to come, but his girlfriend doesn't want Abby to go with them. Lev runs off and takes a boat to travel to the Scars Island to get his mother. Yara panics and says to Abby that their mother will kill Lev if he goes to the camp. As a result, Abby and Yara travel to the pier to find their own boat so they can get to the island. Before they can do that though, Abby is pinned down by a sniper. It's Tommy. Manny appears and both he and Abby are surprised to see one another. Manny informs Abby that Tommy has taken out his entire squad single-handedly. They manage to advance into a cruise ship terminal in pursuit of Tommy. In their events, however, Manny is shot in the head and Abby is visibly shocked by this. Abby moves through a restaurant and is surprised by Tommy on her exit. Yara interferes and pushes Tommy over the edge, allowing Abby and her to get a boat and leave for the island. It's probably around this time that Ellie and Jesse leave the theatre and push towards the aquarium. During this trip though, they encounter a patrol who mentions Tommy. Jesse and Ellie have a minor agreement on how they should proceed. Ellie wants to take the boat and go to the aquarium, believing that they only have a short window of opportunity and Jesse wants to go and get Tommy. As a result, they split up and Ellie manages to steal the boat and get to the aquarium. A violent storm breaks out and Ellie is thrown from the boat by a huge wave, but she makes it and comes across Owen and Mel arguing. She kills them both during a struggle, but they both die before they can tell her where Abby is. Ellie is visibly shell-shocked as she realises that Mel is pregnant and that she has effectively just killed the baby too. Tommy walks up to Ellie, who has now teamed up with Jesse, and they all leave together, but Ellie leaves her map behind. After a few hours, Abby and Yara make it to the island. They arrive there just as Isaac is carrying out his grand plan to attack the island. After sneaking through the villages, they find Lev, who has been attacked by his mother, and his mother is now dead. They leave together, but on attempting to escape, Yara is grabbed by a wolf and is shot. They are cornered by more wolves and Isaac walks out the woods towards Abby. He tells her to let him shoot Lev. He is prepared to shoot Abby as a result and counts to three, but before he can shoot her, a still alive Yara pulls out a gun and kills Isaac. After fighting through the WLF, Abby and Lev have to make it to a boat. Fighting their way through and defeating a huge Seraphite, they make it to a boat and head back to the aquarium. But when they get into the aquarium, they find the bodies of Owen and Mel. Abby throws up as all of her friends and the love of her life are dead. Lev finds the map and Abby, assuming that this is the work of Tommy, sets out for the Cassandra Theatre with Lev. When they get into the theatre, Abby confronts Tommy. She hits him and the sound draws Ellie and Jesse from the next room. Jesse and Ellie burst through the door, but Abby shoots Jesse, killing him. She forces Ellie to throw her weapon. Tommy attacks Abby, but Lev shoots him with an arrow and Abby shoots Tommy in the head. Ellie makes a run for it. Ellie and Abby fight. Abby is gaining the upper hand when Dina comes in and attacks Abby. Lev shoots Dina with an arrow and Abby attacks Dina. Abby is about to brutally kill Dina, but Lev intervenes. Abby says she doesn't ever want to see Ellie again and leaves with Lev. Months later, Ellie and Dina have seemingly settled down with a house and Dina has given birth to a baby boy named JJ. All seems well and Ellie is herding some sheep into their barn when a shovel simply falls to the ground and triggers PTSD in Ellie regarding how she witnessed Joel's death. She comes round and is comforted by Dina. More time passes and Ellie returns home after hunting rabbits. They have a visitor. It's Tommy. He's half blind and can't walk very well after he was shot in the head by Abby. 
He tells Ellie that they have a lead on Abby, who seems to be in Santa Barbara. Dina intervenes and tells him they aren't about that anymore. Tommy's hurt by this, as his brother's killer is still out there, and he simply can't go himself. He guilt trips Ellie, saying that she promised to make Abby pay. He leaves, but his words obviously worked, as Ellie is severely struggling with PTSD and feels that killing Abby will bring her some sort of closure. Dina tries to stop her, but Ellie leaves for Santa Barbara anyway. While Ellie is en route to Santa Barbara, Abby and Lev arrive at 2425 Constance. A tip leads them to an underground basement bunker with a radio inside. They radio for help and all seems lost until a voice comes through. The fireflies are alive and still active. They test Abby to see if she is indeed an ex-firefly and as she passes, they inform Abby and Lev that if they can get to Catalina Island, they can join them. Ecstatic, they begin to head to Owen's sailboat but are attacked and captured by a local group called the Rattlers. They are taken as slaves for a couple of months. Ellie arrives and finds their sailboat along with a clue on a notepad, 2425 Constance. She sets out to find it, but on her way there she gets caught in a trap and gets horrifically wounded. After a while, the same rattlers who took Abby and Lev turn up. She manages to get free and kills both of the men, but not before they tell her where Abby is. She tracks Abby down, and after a few months of being malnourished, she is strung up to a pillar on the beach as a punishment for trying to escape. Ellie cuts Abby down, who then cuts down Lev, and Abby leads Ellie to some boats so they can all escape. Ellie and Abby fight. Ellie, despite losing two fingers in the fight, has the upper hand and is about to succeed in killing Abby when she has a moral epiphany of Joel and stops and lets her go. Distraught, Ellie sits there as Abby sails away. Eventually, Ellie returns back home but finds Dina and JJ gone and the house empty. Ellie leaves the house and walks away, ending the story for now. Now that is a long story. But now let's start to unpack what happened. So what caused this outbreak? Well, in The Last of Us, unlike other zombie-esque horror titles, it wasn't started through a malicious corporation, nor was it a man-made virus. It was purely a result of nature, a mutated strain of an otherwise harmless, to humans at least, virus. Well, when I say virus, I really mean infection. The infection which ravaged the Earth in The Last of Us is called the Cordyceps Brain Infection, or CBI for short. It's a fungal infection. Cordyceps fungus is actually real and is dubbed the zombie fungus. It exists deep in the jungle and it primarily infects creatures and literally turns them into zombies. It's very malicious and has the strength to wipe out entire species. The spores from the fungus land on the skin and embed themselves into the muscle of the creature. Apparently these spores control the creature and make it move to an alternate location which is a perfect environment for fungi reproduction. It's parasitic in its nature, so after the creature is dead, it feeds off the creature, reproducing fungus in order to release more spores and therefore infect more creatures. It can't affect humans, as the human body is much more adept at fighting off infection. So if it can't affect human beings, how did it all start? Mutation. The strain of this infection evolved somehow before the events of The Last of Us. It became stronger, more contagious. This specific strain was called Ophiocordyceps unilateralis, at the start of The Last of Us, Sarah, Joel's daughter, finds a newspaper stating that a mysterious illness is breaking out and it seems the culprit was contaminated crops imported from South America. An insect must have been infected with the cordyceps and landed on the crops, which contaminated the other crops, creating a mutation and starting the downfall of civilization. So after being infected by the cordyceps, the infection would normally take around th two to three days to kill a human. The body literally dies from the inside as the parasite takes over. The fungus attacks the brain and starts manipulating the behavior of the host. Someone can be infected through a bite, through an infected corpse, or through airborne spores. Full body deterioration when exposed to spores only takes a few minutes. There are four main stages of infection, and we see these four stages on a Fedra leaflet. Stage 1 infected are called runners. These are the people who have recently become infected. Although they are the weakest of the four stages, they still possess high speed of movement and have a tendency to attack people as part of a horde. They still seem to possess some part of their consciousness, as sometimes they will walk somewhere and then tend to hunch over and moan or cry. This is down to the cordyceps infection not fully taking hold yet. They seem to be semi-aware of what they are doing, but are powerless to stop it. They also moan in pain due to the cordyceps growing in their body. Their appearance seems to show them as suffering hair loss, bloodshot eyes, and being covered in lesions. Stage 2 infected are called stalkers. 
time frame of this stage of infection is anywhere from two weeks to a year. These infected, as suggested by the name, tend to hide themselves and camouflage themselves by merging with cordyceps fungus on walls and then breaking free and ambushing survivors. Their appearance shows them with fungal growth around their eyes and upper body. Stage 3 infected are called clickers, formed and mutated from one year after initial infection. You will hear them before you see them. A unique clicking sound emanates from them when they stand still. This has a purpose though, they have developed a form of echolocation which can detect the slightest movement, hence why when you get too close to one, they'll run towards you flailing their arms aimlessly. This is because they are completely blind due to the cordyceps fungus growing over their eyes. They can even at some point be seen scratching at it, trying to get it out of the way, which might suggest that some vestigial human memory remains. As for their appearance, their skull seems to have split in two in order to accommodate the facial cordyceps growth. And finally, the last of the four stages is the bloater. At this point, the fungal growth has expanded so much that it's essentially started to produce an armor type of plating. This growth ends up causing the host to bloat significantly. They possess the ability to throw spore bombs by tearing fungus off of their own bodies. It does need to be noted though, that infected only progress to these four different stages under very specific conditions. For example, you see a lot more runners outdoors than clickers. Stalkers and clickers and bloaters tend to be situated indoors rather than outdoors, though at some point you may see some outside due to them wandering. Enclosed, dark and damp spaces seem to be the best. At the end of the life cycle, or when the fungal growth becomes too much for the host to handle, the host tends to just go to a corner and just die, emitting spores so it can infect a new host. This is what's known as a fruiting body, hence the need for gas masks in spore-filled areas. Now, there are two more variants of infected which are more rare. The first of the two is the shambler. These are infected who have been infected for several years and normally reside in damp areas with water nearby. They are similar to bloaters, except they don't throw spore bombs, they just expel acid spore clouds from their bodies, burning the skin of their prey. They also explode upon death. And the second is what's known as the Rat King. This is a special infected, encountered only by Abby in the hospital in Seattle. Formed and mutated over the course of 20 years, since the outbreak began, it contains three infected rolled into one. A clicker, a stalker and a bloater. Attacking it and dealing enough damage will trigger a defense mechanism in which one of the infected types will detach itself from the Rat King and will attack its prey alongside what remains of the Rat King. The Rat King is colossal and possesses a ridiculous amount of strength, literally tearing off limbs if you get too close. As previously mentioned, the Fireflies were a militia. Established in 2013 by Marlene, their main goal was to fight back against military oppression in QZs, or quarantine zones. They suffered many casualties in their war against Fedra and were in danger of being completely wiped out. But the casualties didn't just come from the war against Fedra. Due to the Firefly cause, they were going to QZs and create an uprising, causing survivors to brutally revolt against the military. After the Fireflies gained control, these unaffiliated rebels eventually got tired of taking orders from the Fireflies, so these unruly citizens turned against the Fireflies and started killing them too. These citizens became what are known as Hunters. Hunters had this vision and goal of creating their own government. When Joel and Tommy first left Austin, they joined a group of hunters. They regularly took part in ambushing tourists, which is what hunters call outsiders, and took part in torturing people for information and stealing their food and supplies. Due to this, Tommy and Joel's relationship soured. Tommy wasn't happy with the things they were doing just to survive, so he and Tommy split, and Tommy joined the Fireflies hoping for a life with more purpose to it. I mean, I say that, but he went to Denver and bombed military checkpoints as part of a Firefly terrorist cell anyway. The Fireflies, due to being attacked by hunters, were forced to flee. This left the citizens to adopt a survival of the fittest mentality instead of trying to rebuild civilization. Shortly after the Denver mission, Tommy left the Fireflies and moved to Jackson County to settle where he met his wife Maria. Over the years, the Fireflies searched in vain for a cure for the Cordyceps brain infection, setting up research stations but found nothing. That was until 2033 when in Boston, the Fireflies were involved in a shootout with the military outside of the QZ and were losing. Ellie and Riley used smoke bombs to help the Fireflies escape. They went into a nearby mall and became trapped by infected but were saved and then captured by the Fireflies. Marlene turns up and obviously recognises Ellie, so orders them kept alive. Marlene frees them and then she tells Ellie about her mother. She gives her an envelope which contains a letter from her mother. Marlene mentions that she's been watching over Ellie for years as a promise to her dead mother. 
She gives Ellie her knife, a switchblade which belonged to her mother, which we see in the game. Then we all know what happens. Ellie and Riley get bitten, Ellie survives, Riley doesn't. Marlene sees Ellie as a huge advancement in their search for a cure. The events of the game then play out. So what happened to the Fireflies after Joel killed Dr. Anderson? We know that upon Joel's escape from the hospital he was cornered by Marlene and that he shot her. His reason for this was that he knew that Marlene and the Fireflies would come after Ellie for the cure. Well, also due to the death of Dr. Anderson this caused them to believe that their only cure for CBI was now gone and due to the death of their leader Marlene at the hands of Joel they became extremely demoralised. Over the years they lost countless battles to the US military and eventually voted as a group to disband bringing about the end of the Fireflies. The Fireflies that didn't want to disband ended up moving and starting up other smaller factions and many others wanted to go after Joel and Ellie and continue making a cure. This led to Abby and her friends, the Salt Lake crew, joining the WLF in Seattle. At the end of the game we see that a small group of around 200 Fireflies had set up base in Santa Barbara on Catalina Island as Abby and Lev contacted them. Better known as Wolves, the WLF are a paramilitary organisation in Seattle. They started out similar to hunters who became enraged at the rule of the military and Fedra in the QZs so rose up and as the name suggests the goal was to liberate Washington. Not necessarily by killing the military or Fedra but by stealing military supplies and hitting convoys. They were started up and led by married couple Jason and Emma Patterson. After the Pattersons were taken out by the military Isaac became the WLF's only leader. He was voted in but shortly after he escalated their goals to killing Fedra soldiers. This was met with some controversy but actually seemed to strengthen their cause as many more civilians ended up joining them as well as defectors from Fedra themselves. The majority of the military eventually pulled out deeming the fight against the wolves impossible. All the fighting and tensions led to one final assault on what remained of the military in Fedra culminating in the WLF gaining control of the Seattle QZ. However, with great power comes great responsibility. Due to the number of infected in Seattle, it came difficult to transport food and supplies to survivors. As usual, an uprising was brewing due to unrest, so Isaac ordered the population of Seattle to be moved and housed inside the Soundview Stadium, which is based on the real-life Lumen Field, home of the Seattle Sounders and the Seahawks. He ordered the WLF to hunt and kill all remaining members of Fedra and the military hiding in the city. He also ordered any civilians outside the stadium to move to the stadium or to leave Seattle, facing execution if they refused to leave. Ruling with an iron fist is what led many people to believe the WLF were actually no better than those before them. So if the WLF were hostile to outsiders, why did they accept the Salt Lake crew into their ranks? Well, the Fireflies were well documented from the start of the outbreak and were likely quite notorious. It's very likely that WLF had heard of them and maybe even took some form of inspiration from them. They had similar hatreds, which was the US government and the military, and to be honest, why wouldn't they accept soldiers with battle experience? But that being said, the military and Fedra were not the only enemies in the crosshairs of the WLF. This leads us to the Seraphites. Scars, which is considered to be a derogatory term by the Seraphites, were started during the early days of the outbreak. Started by a woman who is known only as the Seraphite Prophet. This prophet saw a vision of living an egalitarian lifestyle. Now this essentially means that you believe in the principle that all people are equal and deserve equal rights and opportunities. Very similar to the goals of the WLF, no? Although similar in its concept to socialism, they have two different methods with which to achieve their goals, but that's a different story that we won't discuss here. As normally happens to people during times of strife, people begin to latch onto anything that gives them the slightest bit of hope in dark times. The prophet discussed her visions in a religious text which, as with most religions and cults, the members worship and study from. Her belief was that CBI was a warning from some sort of god, that all the technological advances of mankind had poisoned the atmosphere, and as a result must live off the land and lead a more simplistic life. At some point down the line though, the prophet and her seraphites blew up a truck, which contained soldiers. This sparked a three-way war between Fedra, the WLF and the seraphites. One battle dubbed Martyr's Gate between the three sides culminated in the Prophet being captured by the WLF and she was imprisoned and tortured. We find a note by a WLF soldier stating that she talked to the Prophet and it seemed that the Seraphites and the Prophet weren't as insane as the soldiers had been led to believe, stating that the Prophet seemed to talk a lot of sense. She was later freed by the Seraphites and once the WLF had defeated the military, the Seraphites started to move in and occupy the suburbs of Seattle. They attacked and threatened the residents who were living there, forcing them out. 
As a result, the residents received an offer to join the WLF and fight back against the Seraphites. To escape the WLF, a settlement was set up on an island just outside of Seattle. The Prophet died at some point, but it's not really clear how. But it does seem that Isaac executed her, as at one point, Abby says this. Isaac. Fuck. You turned a crazy person into a martyr. A truce was struck, but as is normally the case with two warring factions, it doesn't take much to break it. Both sides blamed one another, and the fighting broke out once again. It does seem, however, that since the death of the Prophet, her words of prophecy have been twisted and used for bad much like most religious texts in the world today. This was remarked upon by Lev, stating that this is not what the Prophet would have wanted at all. However, it does need to be noted that Abby disagrees with Lev on this point, as the Prophet herself even committed acts of violence. The cult has a hierarchy, one example being that the elders get first choice of food, and it goes down through levels. Some people at the bottom don't get any food at all. This is a far cry from the egalitarian lifestyle they claim to follow. This likely changed after the death of the Prophet. They all have a scar, hence the nickname on their faces, apparently to acknowledge the imperfection of mankind or something like that. Due to their belief about the sins of mankind, they believe that human sacrifice would atone for their own sin. This is why they tend to gut their victims, exclaiming that they were nested with sin. They also developed a primitive form of communication, whistling. This is used to communicate things like their positions, whether they are in danger, or if they see a trespasser. The elders of the cult also reserved themselves the right to a wife, and this sometimes took the form of a young child. This leads us to Lev. Lev is a transgender male who was marked to become the wife of a Seraphite elder. Due to not wanting this to happen and seeing himself as male, Lev shaved his head, much to the dismay of the Seraphites. He and his sister Yara were banished from the Seraphites and were hunted and captured at one point, in which we see in the game. Their mother was so devout in her faith that she sided with the cult, so much so that when Lev returned to her, she tried to kill him. So why were they annoyed about Lev shaving his head? Well, the Seraphites dress identically with minor differences between the men and the women. The women have their hair braided, and the men all shave their heads and have no facial hair. This is why the Seraphites were so annoyed at Lev shaving his head. He had been handpicked to become the wife of an elder, but changed his appearance to be more like a man. After the main events of the game, Abby and Lev, as well as Ellie, come across a faction called the Rattlers. While we won't spend too much time on these people, they do have some input into the story. Based in Santa Barbara, California, the Rattlers are a slaver gang. Based out of a large mansion, they patrol the suburban areas looking for survivors to capture. They also capture infected so they can chain them up and put them on the perimeters, I guess to deter people from trespassing. Due to their sadistic nature, they lock the slaves up in cages, and if a slave tries to escape, they send them down to what they call the Pillars, which are wooden beams on the beach designed to kill the slave by exposing them to the elements. Which is why we see a very sunburned and emaciated Abby at the game's end. After Ellie freed the prisoners following her taking out the majority of the Rattlers, it's likely that the remaining Rattlers were killed by the escapees. So that explains what started the outbreak, the different infected, and the antagonistic factions, but there are still a couple of questions to answer here. The first being, how did Abby find Joel? We see a few flashbacks of Abby and Owen in Seattle, which show that at numerous points Abby is searching for leads on Joel. She obsessed over it, to the point in which it led to her and Owen breaking up. It took her around four years to find him, but she eventually found him through Tommy. It seems that an ex-Firefly joined the WLF, and Abby asked about Tommy, and the man mentioned that he moved to a settlement in Jackson County, Wyoming. She got all of her friends on board. But it likely wasn't just the death of her father that spurred Abby on. There were numerous things. Remember, Abby was a firefly. Like the other fireflies, she believed in a cure for CBI, and that was now gone, as Joel didn't just kill her father, he likely killed the only man for miles that possessed the skill to create a vaccine. He also killed Marlene, their leader, and as young people, the Salt Lake crew probably looked up to her. Nora and Mel, being students of Dr. Anderson, were likely enraged due to their closeness with him. So this wasn't just about Abby's father, this was about Joel's actions leading to the downfall of the Fireflies too, and dooming humanity. Many people, like myself, were shocked by the death of Joel. Some people even flat out disapproved. You know, people loved Joel. The one thing you cannot blame Joel for in his anger and brutality is the death of his daughter Sarah. As you'll recall, she was shot by the US military, following an order to eliminate anyone regardless of infection. We learn that in the years after, Joel and Tommy teamed up as hunters, but even Tommy, Joel's own brother, grew to hate him so much due to his actions that he had to walk away. 
Many topics of Last of Us debates involve the question of Joel being justified in his actions, but under a microscope he wasn't really justified at all. His best friend and partner Tess died to protect Joel and Ellie so they could progress on their journey to deliver Ellie to the Fireflies. He completely undermined her sacrifice, meaning that this actually meant nothing in the end. The game doesn't really tell us whether Ellie was informed that she would die during the operation as we don't see this. This all comes down to Sarah and her death. Joel had lost Sarah and didn't want to lose Ellie. Remember, they were travelling to Salt Lake City over the course of pretty much an entire year, and she even saved his life at one point. They were close. But this wasn't about saving mankind, or Ellie at all though. This was all about Joel. Pretty selfish really. He didn't think about the millions of lives that could have potentially been saved. Joel said at some point in the game that eventually his luck will run out. This tells us that Joel knew at some point in his life that his past was going to catch up with him. After he's been shot in the leg, he has no clue who Abby is at that point, but he says this. Why don't you say whatever speech you got rehearsed? Get this over with. This is a man who knew this would happen at some point. He's already accepted it. I mean, the guy hasn't exactly poured coffee over someone's computer. He's destroyed the Fireflies and killed their hope at finding a cure. To the Fireflies, at least, that's huge. Joel also seems to show no remorse for what he did, even after Ellie said that she wanted her life to matter. I was supposed to die in that hospital. My life would have fucking mattered. If somehow the Lord gave me a second chance at that moment, I would do it all over again. But did Joel deserve to die? No, not really. The flashback of Joel and Ellie on the porch left me frustrated, as they had agreed to repair their relationship and then the day after he was killed. But if you really look deeper and discover his character, he really wasn't a very good person. But then again, is anyone in this game really a good person? So right at the end of the game, Ellie and Abby fight. But all this shows us, even after watching Abby kill Joel and travelling to Seattle, hunting Abby in Seattle, killing and torturing Abby's friends, seeing Abby on the pillars on the beach and not immediately killing her, shows that Ellie is horribly conflicted. Ellie understands why Abby did what she did. I know why you killed Joel. He did what he did to save me. It's likely that Nora told Ellie about Abby's dad when she was trying to get information from her. That's very likely why Ellie is so shell-shocked here. She's not shocked because of what she did to Nora. She's shocked because she realises that Abby had a reason for why she killed Joel. You see, Ellie, after cutting Abby down from the pillar, at that moment realised that Abby had just been through something far worse than what Ellie would do to her. She decided to let her go. Until this moment, when Ellie checked her wound and had a flashback of Joel, changing her mind. They fight, and then Ellie is drowning Abby and stops. But why? Well, it's because of this flashback. Ellie saw herself on the porch with Joel, and she had chosen to try and start to forgive him. She saw that she is in fact capable of mercy. She also realised that this obsession with revenge was eating away at her. So at that moment, she simply decided to forgive Abby and let her go. This ended the cycle of violence that was ignited by Joel. This is less about vengeance for Ellie and more about accepting that Joel is gone, dealing with that and accepting that killing Abby isn't going to change anything. We see at the latter stage of the game that after the nightmare at the Cassandra, Dina and Ellie are back in Jackson, although not living in the settlement, and Dina has given birth to a little boy named JJ after his late father Jesse. After Ellie decides to leave to go after Abby, it appears that Dina packed up all their stuff and left the house with JJ. But what happens after that? I mean, the game doesn't really tell us, but I'm sure the next game will. What can only be assumed at this point is that Dina and JJ went back to live in the Jackson settlement. We find a letter on the table from Jesse's parents. Dina does mention in the game at the start, while she's out on patrol with Ellie, that Jesse's parents are like her family, given that Dina's family are all dead. This letter shows that those thoughts are reciprocated, as they say that she will always be family to them. Off the back of the letter, it's clear that Dina and JJ went to stay with Jesse's parents, which makes sense, seeing as they're JJ's grandparents. Whether she and Ellie got back together remains to be seen, as it did seem like Dina gave the impression that if she leaves to go after Abby, then that's it for them. After Ellie returns home, she tries to play the guitar which Joel gifted to her, but due to having two fingers bitten off by Abby in their fight, she is unable to play anymore. The final shot of the game is Ellie abandoning the guitar and leaving the house. After Abby and Lev make it to a boat and travel to the aquarium, we see the WLF and the Seraphite still fighting each other. It's likely they just killed each other off until one person was left standing. If you think about it, this entire game focused on a cycle of violence and revenge that didn't really ever have an end in sight without everyone dying in the process. 
Although we don't know if Isaac did actually die after being shot by Yara, the Elders likely fought alongside their fellow Seraphites and they probably all died. I think the game leaves this as an unknown intentionally, as the bigger question is, does it really even matter who won? Obviously at the end of the game we see Abby and Lev sailing off into the mist. It's clear where they're going, they're going to Catalina Island to join up with the Fireflies which was their original plan. This is kind of confirmed by the loading screen on completing the game, as it shows Abby and Lev's boat on a beach with a large dome building in the background. This may give us a hint as what the next stage of this story might feature. Hopefully a lot of questions will be answered in the next instalment of The Last of Us. I'm looking forward to it and I hope you are too. Let me know down in the comments what you think about the plot and the narrative, but ultimately that's it for this video. If you did enjoy this one, please leave a like and subscribe to the channel, but for now, take care and I will see you in the next one.